I'm going to take a few minutes now to discuss a brief overview of clinical research and the clinical research careers that we have in North Carolina. For our agenda today, we're going to be looking at some very brief topics that include what is a clinical trial and how is it regulated, who are the key players, what is the drug development process, what type of careers exist, the current educational opportunities in North Carolina, and what the, the clinical research arena looks like in North Carolina and how BioNetwork fits into all of this. So what is a clinical trial? Clinical trials basically are research studies that test how well new medical treatments work in people. Most people think of them as drug studies, and most of them are testing new drugs, but some do test other interventions, such as herbal remedies and lifestyle modifications. Regardless of what they're studying, however, clinical trials answer scientific questions and attempt to find improved ways to prevent, screen for, diagnose, or treat a disease. The backbone of every trial is the clinical trial protocol. This document is an action plan for conducting the entire trial. It describes many things, including why the trial is important, what research questions will be answered, how the trial will be conducted, and how subjects will be kept safe. Clinical trials are highly regulated on both on federal, state, and even the international levels. Um, some of the international guidance that we have includes ICHGCP, which is also known as Good Clinical Practice, the Belmont Report, the Declaration of Helsinki, and the Nuremberg Code. ICHGCP is an international standard covering all aspects of a clinical trial, whereas the others are documents specifically related to ethics and the fair treatment of research subjects. On a national level in the U.S., the Code of Federal Regulations contains several parts that specifically relate to clinical research. Title 21 is reserved for the FDA and includes regulations on all research on substances that are intended for eventual marketing. And Title 45 is reserved for the Department of Health and Human Services, Part 46 specifically dealing with clinical research that's federally funded. Each of these are enforceable by law and failure to comply can result in significant penalties. And for the remainder of this talk, we'll be focusing on definition and terms used in Title 21 of the CFR. So who are the key players in clinical research? Um, three of these key players are specifically defined and described in Title 21 of the regulations. They are the sponsor, or a con contract research organization, which we'll talk about in a minute, investigators, and the IRB, or Institutional Review Board. Each of these have specific definitions and duties outlined in Title 21, and we'll go over them now. The first role we're going to look at is the sponsor. A sponsor is an individual or an organization who initiates and takes responsibility for a clinical trial but does not actually conduct the investigation. We typically think of the pharmaceutical companies as sponsors, but other companies and individuals can also be a sponsor. Some of their specific responsibilities include selecting qualified investigators, providing the protocol, ensuring compliance with all regulations, and reporting any safety changes to investigators. We mentioned earlier there was a contract research organization, and this is also defined by the regulations. Um, they're commonly referred to as CROs, and they are companies or individuals who assume any or all of the obligations of a sponsor. The, tra the transfer of duties is documented in writing, and at that point, the CRO is subject to the same regulatory action as a sponsor for failure to comply with regulations. So therefore, any mention of the word sponsor in the regulations also applies to a CRO to the extent that the CRO has assumed those obligations. The next role I want to discuss is the investigator. The clinical investigator is an individual who conducts an investigation or, as is more often the case, is the responsible leader of a team of individuals who conducts the trial. 
The investigator takes on full responsibility for the conduct of the study and the integrity of the research data and is the person that is subject to any penalties for noncompliance. The investigator can delegate duties to specific team members, however he or she retains the responsibility for proper conduct. The Institutional Review Board, or IRB, is our third key player that is mentioned in the regulations. And this is a board, committee, or other group of formula, formally designated to review and to approve the initiation of and to conduct periodic review of biomedical research that involves human subjects. They are chiefly responsible for assuring the protection of the rights and welfare of the human subjects by ensuring that the risks assumed by taking part in the study do not outweigh the potential benefits. Specific membership requirements for IRBs are outlined in the regulations and as well as duties such as record keeping and they're actually listed in Title 45. So we're going to um, jump ahead to the drug development process now and I want to start with a little trivia, just some facts to consider. Um, first, it takes approximately 12 to 15 years to bring a compound from the laboratory actually to market and it costs close to 800 even to 900 million dollars to develop and market these drugs. And only about 1 in 50,000 chemical compounds actually completes the drug development cycle and eventually makes it to market. So you can see this is a very time consuming process. And here we have a clinical development timeline. It's a very simplified schematic of a typical clinical, de clinical development process and you can see that it includes, it includes many phases of development. These phases include preclinical testing, phase 1, 2, and 3, which are often divided into 3A and 3B, and phase 4, which is also called post-marketing research. As you can see at the top of the image, regulatory permission to test is sought between the preclinical and phase 1 portions, and permission to market or to sell the drug is requested is not requested until after phase three when enough data have been gathered about the drug. And now we'll look at these phases in a bit more detail. Preclinical testing is also sometimes referred to as phase zero, consists of laboratory testing to determine a compound's safety and pharma pharmacological properties. These, te these tests provide rationale required to support the evaluating the product in humans for a specific indication. They answer such questions as what happens to the drug in the body? How long is the drug effective? What happens to the body when given the drug? Is the drug safe and tolerable? And how should the drug be taken? The next step is phase one, and this is done after preclinical testing is complete. This is the first use of a new drug in humans. These studies typically dose healthy volunteers, but in some cases they can dose subjects who have end-stage disease who lack other treatment options. The purpose of these studies is to gather information on tolerance, metabolism, and drug interactions. At this point, they're not investigating efficacy, which is how well a drug works. It usually consists of 20 to 80 subjects, so they're very small, and they last anywhere from six months to a year. Phase two trials are generally concerned with gathering data on effectiveness and short-term safety, exploring the use for the targeted indication, and establishing dose-response relationship and estimating a dose for future studies. They normally involve a very small population, but this time the population is of disease subjects, and this may include testing for other indications. Usually there are about 100 to 300 people in these studies. And phase two is actually the most common point of failure for a new drug, as this is where the drug is discovered not to work as planned or to have toxic effects. So once passing phase two, the new drug moves into phase three, where studies are conducted to further confirm safety and assess the effectiveness in a larger population. At this point, the new drug is typically compared to currently available therapies, and these trials tend to last about three years. 
And at this point, we're starting to get into the large population of disease subjects, and this is the, the typical clinical trial that most people think of. And finally, phase four, which is also called post-marketing surveillance, um, occurs after permission to market has been sought and after phase 3A and phase 3B studies have been completed. At this point, the trial is continuing to evaluate safety, but with a focus on long-term events. Populations in these studies are very large and can, ha can include several thousand subjects, and they tend to last several months to several years. So now that we have a basic understanding of the drug development process, we're going to talk about different careers in clinical research. The first career I want to mention is the clinical research coordinator. These individuals are on the front lines, so to speak, working directly with investigators and research subjects. They tend to be in academic institutions or in private practice where the vast majority of study participants can be located. The study coordinator is typically in charge of managing the research study and is directly involved with recruiting and enrolling research participants, arranging follow-up visits, maintaining study drugs and supplies, and completing the case report or data collection forms and the regulatory documents. Typical minimum requirements for clinical research coordinator are a bachelor's degree in life science, or related field of certification, such as an RN, a minimum of two years' experience in a clinical environment um, is desired. And of course, these, these requirements vary by investigative sites and, and different companies. Typical salary ranges between $35,000 and $50,000, and a possible career path outlined on the slide is the research coordinator who then moves up to a site manager who may manage several research teams and eventually into project management. However, another career path that many research coordinators take includes a jump, if you will, from the investigative site to a CRO of sponsor or a sponsor as a clinical research associate. And a clinical research associate is a person employed by a sponsor or a CRO and is responsible for monitoring the clinical trials to ensure pro protocol compliance. And they do this by performing on-site visits and reviewing trial data and communicating with the investigators. Minimum requirements for this type of job, and again, these vary by company, is a bachelor's degree in the life sciences or a related field of certification, two years experience in the clinical environment that included experience in clinical trials, Average salary is anywhere from 45000 to 120000 and this depends on your experience and your seniority. Many possible, there are many possible career paths, one of which we've outlined here is to move up the ranks into a senior CRA and eventually through to project management. Now, these are only two careers that we've highlighted in detail, but there are many, many other career options. These include research assistants, biostatisticians, medical writers, regulatory affairs professionals, quality assurance professionals, contract and budget negotiators, and information system analysis analysts. Some of these are entry level and some are areas that require extensive experience, but all of them work to support clinical research operations at some level. So we've talked about careers, now the question is, how do you get there? We want to focus now on current opportunities here in North Carolina. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is a new online course that will be offered through the North Carolina Bio Network in just a few short weeks. Um, this course involves six different modules, each focusing on a different aspect of clinical research, including drug development, human subjects protection, regulations and guidance, IRBs, comparing the two CFRs, Title 45 and Title 21, because they are different, and clinical research study management. Courses are very interactive and scenario-based, and they provide an excellent entry-level learning experience for those wanting to know more about the field of clinical research. For those wanting a more formal path of education, 
several associate degree and, and certificate programs are available within the state. These include a certificate and associate degree programs at Durham Tech, which Lauren will go to in a bit more detail later, and a certificate course at Cape Fear Community College in Wilmington, North Carolina. There are also bachelor and master's programs available. Campbell University and the University of North Carolina at Wilmington both offer a bachelor's and a master's of science in clinical research. And Wake Forest University offers a master of science in clinical population and translational research. So, And if you're interested in more information about clinical research, there are some books and, and magazines that you may want to look into. Three books that I personally recommend are The Fundamentals of Clinical Trials, Ethics and Regulation of Clinical Research, and then Clinical Research by Miller and Crabtree. And there are various journals and magazines um, which you can look, at, look up on the internet and subscribe to as well. And then finally, we have some professional organizations, which are also um, great areas to get more information. The first is SOCRA, which is the Society of Clinical Research Associates. They have about 13,000 members, and they are focused in um, more of the study coordinator uh, and project management levels. You have ACRP, the Association of Clinical Research Professionals, which has about 20,000 members, and they are more focused on the clinical research associate and the pharmaceutical side of the industry. And then SRA International, which is the Society of Research Administrators, and they handle more of the budgets, contracts, and financial obligations, and they have about 4,000 members. <laughs> 